All right, so today I want to share some ball python breeding tips with you, specifically going into the egg laying season. And it's kind of funny, I actually started pairing up in mid-October, and usually I get my first eggs mid-March. So it's the very beginning of March, and I'm expecting to get my first eggs in about two weeks. And there's been a lot of people breeding for the very first time, getting a little nervous about getting your first eggs. And in this video, I want to give you some tips for your very first eggs or tips going into the beginning of the egg laying season. And there's a couple things I wanted to mention before I actually jump right into it. As a matter of fact, uh, I usually don't ask people to subscribe on my channel. I figure if you like my content, you'll subscribe and every single YouTuber on the planet on every single video is asking you to subscribe. It seems like it's kind of redundant asking you to subscribe, but I've actually found a weird glitch that some YouTubers are complaining about that people are actually getting unsubscribed from their channel so if you're actually subscribed or you think you're subscribed you may want to double check to see if you're still subscribed and hit that button if you're not and if, if you actually subscribe to my channel it really helps me to meet some milestones you know it, it helps your channel grow and it really as a matter of fact if you subscribe it doesn't really give me any extra money I don't get paid for subscribers but if you reach certain milestones it seems Seems like some videos are maybe promoted a little bit more based on your subscribers. It's kind of weird how it works. So the first thing I wanted to jump into is the egg box. So I actually cranked up my egg incubator, got it set at 90 degrees, got it all set up, make sure that the temperature is stable. You definitely want your temperatures in your incubator to be on and stable for probably a week or two before you actually get eggs. And the other thing is, is I actually use these egg boxes. It's like a little kind of a shoe box like this, and it has just a little cover on it. And essentially, <laughs> what Bobby's doing, grab it onto my all right, Bobby. He's got a hold on me. All right. <laughs> Crazy snake. All right. So essentially what I use is I use this little shoe box here and I use a, a cover. But what I actually do instead of the cover, I actually put press and seal over the top when I actually get eggs. And then I have a little grate inside that sits right on my vermiculite. I actually put, I think it's 200 grams of vermiculite and 200 grams of water weighed out. You know, you have to weigh it with a balance and make sure it's 50 50 by weight. That's been working perfect. And I think I actually went a little less than 200 grams last year. I think I was using like 180 or something like that, just so I wouldn't run out of room in my box. And probably one of the biggest things is when you're getting ready for the next year, you're getting ready for some eggs. What you really want to do is you want to make sure these boxes are super sterile. I would say not really like clean room sterile, but you want to go through and make sure you bleach them and disinfect them really well. So I've actually lost quite a few eggs in the incubator. And essentially what you're doing is you're putting an egg in the incubator at 90 degrees, almost 100% of humidity, and you're letting it sit there for about two months. And let me tell you, it's really hard to keep down the mold and the fungus and the bacteria in there for two months at those conditions. So really going into it, you really want to keep as sterile of an environment as possible. As a matter of fact, I saw one video where they're actually taking the eggs from the ball python and quickly dunking them in a bleach solution to try to sterilize them before putting them in a sterile egg box. And I probably wouldn't recommend doing the bleach, but you really want to keep in mind that you, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult to keep the mold and the fungus off of these eggs, you know, for the full two months. And I've actually seen where a lot of eggs, they look really bad. They look like they're getting kind of fuzzy. Sometimes they can smell pretty bad and you'll still have snakes actually hatching out of those eggs. So you don't want to throw them away unless you pretty much know for sure. You know, I can pretty much tell for sure that uh, an egg is bad in my incubator. A lot of times you just open up the incubator and I can smell it right away that I have a really bad egg that's dead in the shell. And a lot of times it seems like once they get to a certain point, I pretty much can't save the egg anymore. And I've, I've tried all different things, you know, trying the antifungal 
little spray and a whole bunch of other stuff. I tried dipping it in an iodine water solution. Seems like nothing will actually recover that egg. So kind of the, on the flip side, what I'm trying to do is trying to get it a little bit more clean and sterile going into the box versus ending up with a lot of, you know, the mold and bacteria and then trying to treat it after it's already way down the road. So I'm going to kind of give you some hints. I'm going to jump over and show you some of my female ball pythons and I want to show you some of the things that you can do to keep things a little bit clean on that end so when you actually get eggs you're not struggling with contamination. All right, so I just want to show you real quick some of these females that I have. I'm going to pull out my three biggest female ball pythons, the ones that I think are going to lay first. So essentially what I do is I go through and I mark all the ones that are breeding. And when you get close to where you're actually getting to the point where you're almost ready to have eggs, I'd say about two weeks away, essentially what you want to do is you want to pull open the tubs and just check to make sure that you don't have any eggs. Look at this girl, she is really close to laying eggs she's really super big and uh, what I actually do is I go through with my ultrasound and I actually you know you can actually do it with an ultrasound or you can just kind of eyeball it at this point any snake that is really big and huge like this that hasn't eaten in like a month you can definitely tell they're full of eggs so essentially what I do is I go through every single snake twice a day and I just crack open the tub a little bit and I peek inside to see if there's eggs you definitely want to catch them as soon as possible. I had one comment on one of my videos. Someone said it was their first year breeding and they were checking every single hour. <laughs> you can actually, I guess you could do that if you just had one snake and you had a lot of time where you could just keep checking on them. But I find, you know, just checking like in the morning and then in the evening is fine. And the, the problem is, is if you actually separate the eggs, I like to actually try to separate the eggs uh, out of the clump so they're not all clumped together. If you actually let them separate for like 24 hours they get really leathery and stuck together really bad so I like to check them so I can actually separate them otherwise they're stuck together and you really can't separate them so so if you just kind of take a look at this tub this is uh, this is actually an ARS 8018 tub a really big tub normally uh, I only use these tubs for really super big ball pythons and if you actually look at this coconut husk I actually use the coconut husk chip this is like a pro cocoa and essentially what I want to do at this point is this this stuff has been in here I'd say probably about a month it's in really good shape because this snake really hasn't eaten anything really hasn't gone to the bathroom it's just kind of sitting here developing the eggs but what I want to do a couple weeks in like right now today like like probably in a few days what I, what I want to do is I want to go through and I want to change all this bedding make sure it's really good bedding and then then uh, once you put the new bedding in, essentially what you want to do is you want to clear out a spot in the back. See this snake is kind of sitting a little bit on the bedding. You want to make sure the snake is completely off of the bedding. And at this point the snake's not going to move at all. It's just going to sit here the whole time because it's just sitting here developing eggs. And then what you want to do is you want to go in and you want to disinfect the bottom and make sure it's super clean. You don't want a dirty bottom with the you know the snake is gonna lay eggs right on the tub here and I found usually you know I, I in most of my tubs I actually keep the back open with no substrate on it and then if the snake goes to the bathroom usually they crawl up to the top here go to the bathroom and then crawl back to the back and it's really easy to spot clean and what I really want to do is I want to keep it as clean as possible during uh, like all the way up to the egg layer season so you definitely want to disinfect the back you want to use new substrate in here and here's another one I can kind of show you some of the other stuff that I have going on so I have another het caramel up here I think this one is gonna lay she's looking really big hasn't eaten for a while this one is a hundred percent het caramel albino I'm actually breeding this back to a scaleless head 50% head caramel albino. I'm hoping for the scaleless head visual caramel albinos, which would be pretty cool. But if you take a look at this one, this is kind of the same way where she's actually sitting right on some of the substrate. That is definitely not what you want. You actually want to move all the substrate up, go through and replace it, and then sterilize the back so they lay eggs right on the sterile tub. 
and I have another one over here. This this is probably, I'd say, these are probably the few that are going to go first. Look at this big old pinstripe. She's looking really good. I crossed this girl with my coral glow. And you can see this one's kind of sitting right on the bottom of the tub, but what I would actually do is I'd pull it up maybe to here, to where there's no substrate even close to that, because you definitely want the eggs to be as clean as possible. It doesn't have to be like super sterile, but I'd definitely be clean. Here's another head caramel I have that I'm breeding back to my uh, het caramel albino scaleless head. Look at that bone. And see, this one's kind of the same where you have a lot of stuff in the back. You really want to clear it out and make sure everything is clean and streamlined, get ready for the eggs. And then what I do is normally, like this one right here, this is kind of the, the size tub I use for my, uh, for a lot of my adult female ball pythons that are kind of like the normal size that aren't really super sized. So what I'll do is I'll just kind of go through all my breeding ones and I'll just peek in real quick. You would definitely want to make sure they have water, fresh water. This girl looks like she is like gonna lay for sure. <laughs> Look at how big this one is. She is a really big lemon blast. Definitely full of eggs. And you just kind of have to go through and check them all, make sure that you are ready for eggs. All right, so it is time for the question of the day. And Colbert David asks, what else can I feed my ball pythons besides rats and mice? <laughs> That's a very good question. I'd say in most cases, most people just feed rats and mice for the staple food for ball pythons. They really don't need anything else, and they really don't need any type of supplementation like minerals or vitamins or anything. And you actually do have some options. Some people actually feed them like an African soft fur or something like a hamster or a gerbil or something like that. The problem with African Suffers is sometimes they can get stuck on them because they like them so much. It's, it's basically the food that they eat in the wild and it's kind of even more so for hamsters. I've heard that a lot of people feeding hamsters, it's almost like candy for ball pythons. Once they get a taste of hamsters, it's hard to go back to anything else. I would say the problem is, is if you actually were to go out and buy a hamster, it would be pretty expensive and I don't think they're as prolific as rats or mice. So you can kind of get stuck on it. And the, the kind of the big thing is, is if you're used to feeding something like hamsters or African softers and something happens and you have to actually sell your snake and that is the only thing they'll eat. A lot of people will have a hard time buying that snake with a specialized diet, something like that. As a matter of fact, I actually bought my spider female ball python and the only thing she ate was mice. And if I'd have known that going into it, I would probably wouldn't have bought that snake because she is a really picky eater and only eats mice. She's even picky with the mice and rarely even eats a rat. So I'd say it's a little bit difficult. The other thing you can actually feed ball pythons where I've heard some people try it, you can actually feed baby chickens. And the problem with chickens is, is you know, if you're hatching out chicks and you have a supply, it could, you know, you, a lot of people think, you know, I actually have all these chickens hatching out. Why not try to feed some to my ball python? The problem I've heard with chickens is that their bones are hollow and the ball python doesn't get enough calcium in their diet. So a lot of times if you're feeding only chickens, you probably have to supplement with some rodents or with some kind of calcium supplement, which is kind of interesting. So that is pretty much it. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.